Johnny Dollar. This is the Milford Advertising Agency in Denver, Colorado, Mr. Dollar. Advertising Agency? Mr. Horace W. Milford would like to speak with you. Hold on, please. Hello, Dollar. That's right, Mr. Milford. Yes, can you come out here to Denver to see me right away? Well, now, look, sir, if you're interested in buying commercial time on my weekly radio program, you'll have to contact CBS Radio in New York. No, Dollar, this is a purely personal matter that I wish to see you about, that I must see you about. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Milford, but unless there's insurance involved... Well, yes. Yes, there is. The uh, same company that's insured my life. One of the outfits I work with? Tri-Western Life Insurance Company? Yeah, that's one of my clients. Well, then, please, come out here right away. Well, I'd better check first with the company no. and get their authorization to... What was that? No, by all means, do not contact the insurance company. Not yet. Well, there's a little matter of my expense account. That will be taken care of, most adequately. Okay, whatever you say. Now, what's this all about, Mr. Milford? Mr. Dollar, here on the phone, I can only tell you it's a matter of preventing... Uh, yeah? Yes? Of preventing a murder. <laughs> Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Mr. Horace W. No. No, to the Tri Western Life Insurance Company. You'll see why later on. And following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the hired homicide matter. Expense account item one, seventy-seven dollars plane fare. The big mainliner took off from Bradley Field in Hartford at 825 p.m. and set me down at Stapleton Field in Denver at the ungodly hour of 335 a.m. Item two, five dollars for a cab into the Brown Palace Hotel where I added some sleep to the few hours I'd had aboard the plane. Breakfast was item three, a dollar fifty. And then I walked over to the office of the Milford Advertising Agency on California Street. Horace W. Milford was tall, gray-haired, and with a very dignified bearing. He got to the point immediately, and yet in a kind of roundabout way. Mr. Dollar, I must emphasize that this whole thing must be completely confidential. Oh, well, now that depends. I will pay you well, very well. You sound as though there might be something illegal about whatever it is you want me to do. I can only hope that you can prevent something illegal from happening. Something terribly wrong. You mentioned murder. I said prevent a murder. Who's, Mr. Melford? Yours? I'll be as brief as possible, Mr. Dollar. Time is of the essence. But first, you must know some background. Go right ahead, sir. Since my wife passed away some years ago, this advertising business and my daughter Claire have been my sole interest in life. How old is Claire? She was 27 on her last... Uh, now, listen, please. I'm listening. I built this business by myself. Until two years ago, I made all the client contacts, planned the campaigns, wrote the copy. I bought the space and radio time, uh -huh. everything. And then Tony came along. Tony? Uh, Anthony Ferringer. He's my son-in-law. And he works for you, Mr. Milford? Out of pity for a young man who seemed to be struggling to make his way in the world, I gave him a job. Oh. And then by way of repaying me, I thought, he brought the Bonar Electronics account to this office. Bonar Electronics Corporation. Yeah, I've heard of them. Pretty big outfit, I understand. It means annual billings of some $2 million to us. Well, that's a sizable advertising account. Now, the point is, well, he told me later, that his means of getting it were somewhat unorthodox. Unethical is a better word. No, how do you mean? He told me that he had something on officers of the Bonar organization, that he'd threatened exposure and ruinous scandal if he weren't permitted to handle their advertising here. Well, now, that doesn't seem possible with a big But company. thanks largely to my own efforts and ideas, we have established them as one of the most important companies in their field. <laughs> Don't ever underestimate the value of advertising, huh? Yes, to the public as well as to the company. Yeah. Well, now, Mr. Once Milton... I took over the account, young Tony was content to sit around, collect his salary and a big commission and do nothing. Uh -huh. Nothing, that is, but constantly remind me that he had brought the business here. I see. But, no. Mr. Dollar, were the account suddenly to go to some other agency, it would ruin me. Oh, how so? Buying this building, setting up the organization adequately to service such an account cost me everything I had. I'm not a young man anymore. 
Well, is somebody else gunning for Bonar Electronics? Oh, far worse than that. Uh, Mr. Dollar. Now, wait a minute, please. I'm afraid we've got far away from the subject of murder that you talked about. Mr. Dollar, far worse than his simply falling down on the job is the fact that Tony Ferringer, against my will, mind you, because I knew him well enough not to trust him, courted and eloped with my daughter. <sighs> well, now, And Mr. it Bilson... wasn't because he loved her, believe me. It was only a further step in a plan to get his hands on this advertising business of mine. You're sure of that? But he had the nerve, the audacity to say so himself. I can see him now sitting right there where you are with a smirk on his face, blandly telling me that now that he'd lost her, he'd have to resort to other tactics. Oh, wait a minute. That he'd have to take this important account away from me by opening his own agency and that I couldn't stop him. Wait a minute, please. You said lost her. What did you mean by that? Because of his duplicity, what he'd done to me, because of the miserable way he treated and tortured her. Claire, my daughter, my only child, Claire took her own life. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, the shock of it almost killed me, Della. Tony Ferringer was bringing my whole life crashing and crushing down upon my head. I hated him. With every fiber of my being, I, I was beside myself. Mr. I could see only one thing left for me Mr. to do. Mr. Milford, please, but if then, you're leading up then to what I think you are. Then my clients at Bonar came to me two days ago, and they told me they realized what had happened and why. And they assured me there was nothing Tony could do or say that would hurt them and that they would stand by me. Well, that straightened me out, Mr. Dollar. Oh. It made me realize that killing Tony, that, well, there, was, there was no point, no use in it. Well, I'm glad of that, sir. But then I'm afraid I don't see why you sent for me. Because it was too late. What? Because I had already hired a man. A professional killer. To murder him? Yes. Well, then, good heavens, man, call him off. I can't. Sure, get in touch with him and... What do you mean you can't? There's no possible way for me to reach him, contact him. Until after he's murdered Tony Ferringer. <laughs> And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Hired Homicide Matter. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Milford. You mean there's no way to reach this hired killer to call him off to tell him not to murder Tony Ferringer? No, none whatever. But look here, you can't just Mr. Stand... Dollar, when the only thing I wanted in life was to see him dead for all the terrible things he did to me and to my daughter. I went about arranging it very carefully. How? By means I don't need to go into here. I finally established a contact in the in the underworld here in Denver. Sort of a stool pigeon, I suppose you'd call him. A man named Eric Blinker. Yeah, yeah. For a price, Blinker had the killer contact me at my home. Do you know the name of this killer? Well, he only told me that if he felt it necessary to phone me or to contact me in any way before the job was done, he would identify himself as Blackie. Oh, great, great. Then the only thing you can do is contact this Eric Blinker again. No. Tell him to call off Blackie. Have Blackie get in touch with you. No, Mr. What Dollar. do you mean, no? Eric Blinker's body was found floating down the Platte River yesterday afternoon, just before I called you. Oh. Oh, but don't you see, Mr. Dollar, unless we can somehow contact this Blackie, he'll go ahead with the murder, the murder I arranged. It must not happen. All right, how much do you know about Blackie? What does he look like? I don't know. But you just finished telling me that he called on you to make arrangements for the killing. He came to my home at night. He insisted on talking to me from outside a window where I couldn't see him. I couldn't see him. All right, did you give him any money? $5,000 in cash. Marked? Huh? Marked bills? No. Oh, fine. Well, he said that if any of the money was marked in any way, that he would know about it and that he wouldn't hesitate to kill me. All right. When was he to do the job? He would only say by the end of the week. And this is Friday. This is Friday. And you can't give me anything to go on to find this man Blackie? Nothing. Unless he calls. Well, if that happens, you don't need me. Mr. Milford. Yes? Have you... Have you told Tony Ferringer anything of this? Good heavens, Dollar. You don't know the man. Can't you see what would surely happen if I did? He would bleed me for everything I have. Me, accessory to a plot to murder him. Don't you see what that means? Yeah, sure I do. And if you were to call in the police, it would be just as... Oh, yeah, Mr. Milford, you've really stuck your neck in a noose. Uh, somehow you, you've got to get me out of this. You? What about Tony? Right guy or wrong, he's the one who's going to be killed. Well, I, I meant stop this thing. I, I don't want his blood on my hands, not anymore. 
Somehow you've got to stop this kill. Oh, yeah, sure, great. But how? You got any good ideas? <sighs> hey, a phony telegram, something like that. What? Yeah, yeah, some kind of a message telling Tony to get out of town. But if it weren't to reach him soon enough, or if he were to disregard it. Hmm. If you were to go to the police. Oh, I'd sooner kill myself. I might as well. Or contact them. An anonymous warning, maybe. There is only one place from which Tony Ferringer might expect trouble. From me. Mr. Milford. Well. Oh, I, I don't know. So so help me, I don't know. I'm I'm not even sure you deserve help after what you've done. I, I beg you, Mr. Dollar. Hey, you you told me on the phone there's insurance involved in all this. Well, when he first came with me, Tony had his life insured. He named some distant relative as the beneficiary. Through Tri- Tri-Western Life? Yes. But he didn't even name Claire in it when he married her. Yeah, well, that's beside the point. Now. Do you have an idea, Mr. Dollar? Is, is something, is, is some way... No, no, the... no. I was just thinking it's not only your neck I've got to look out for now, but I've got to keep the insurance company from having to pay off on Tony. You, you could watch over him. Oh, yeah, sure. Sit on his lap for 24 hours a day without his knowing it. Where is he now? I don't know. Well, where does he live? Well, then you will watch over him. Oh, we'll see. Scribble down his address and phone number for me. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, he, he lives at 425. Now, what does he look like? Uh, about the same height and weight that you are. Uh, here. Ah, good. 425. But his hair and complexion are somewhat different. Tony! That's right, Papa. And who are you, mister? I take it you're Tony Ferringer. That's right. Oh, Tony. Oh, that's... listen, you old fool. I just found out you spoiled my chances of starting my own agency. That you can't bone our electronics into staying with you. No, no, it's because you lied to me about the way you got us that account. Oh, but so Tony, you that... finally caught on. Now, Tony, will you listen to you me? You listen to me. I'm not going to let you get away with this. Please, Tony. Or maybe you will. Maybe I can't stop you. But believe me. Believe me, you're going to pay me plenty. Now, Tony, will you How? please Why? I haven't figured it out yet. But you'll pay me, Papa. Just remember that. Please. Oh, dear. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what to do. Just keep your shirt on, Mr. Milford. Yeah. What? Yeah. And wish me luck. <laughs> Item two, five dollars for a taxi that followed Tony Farage's car to a residential section east of town. And sure enough, he pulled up in front of his own home. Maybe... Maybe the wild, the crazy idea that I'd suddenly got back there in the office would work. Driver. Yeah? End of the line. Pull around this corner and stop. All right, here. Here's a five spot. Stick around for a while. Instead of walking up to Tony's front door, I sneaked around to the back, half hidden by a hedge at the side. I hoped that none of the neighbors would see me and raise a fuss or report me as a prowler. I rang the buzzer at the back door, then stood aside, flat against the wall, so that whoever opened it wouldn't see me. I hoped. Yes? Yes? Hello, somebody ring this door buzzer. Yes! And now... Now, if the rest of this wild plan works out, in you go, Tony. Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. After wasting some fine scotch whiskey, pouring it on Tony Ferringer's clothes, item three was another five to the cabbie for helping me haul my apparently drunken friend to a cheap rooming house over on the other side of town. A place run by a frowsy old dame who called herself Ma Letcher. Here, mister. Just carry him up and let him sleep it off in this room here at the top of the stairs. Here, I'll open it up for you. Yeah, thanks. You ask me, somebody must have hit him with a bottle. Here you are. Well, you can lay him onto the bed. This room will cost you a buck and a half, though. All right, here. Here's a fire spot. Well, thanks. And who do I tell him? And here's another for telling him a, a taxi driver brought him in here. Somebody you never saw before. Oh, don't worry. I know how to keep my mouth shut. 
When I get paid for it. Paid good, that is. Okay, I'll make it ten here. Well, mister, you ain't got a worry in the world. Wanna bet? <laughs> Item four, a dollar ten for another cab back to Tony Ferringer's house. Again, hoping none of the neighbors would see me, I let myself in the back door with a key I'd taken out of his pocket. I figured all I could do now was sit around and wait until the killer showed up. But as I walked through the doorway into the living room... Just hold it. And don't turn around, mister. Hands up high. Blackie? That's right, Blackie. Well, carrying a gun, huh? No, don't turn around. Just walk over to that bench now and sit down. The piano bench. There, in front of you. Now, look, if you think I'm Tony Farringer... Sit down. Now, keep facing that way. Well, I suppose I haven't got much choice. I know you're not Tony, but you know who I am. That means you know what I was hired for. That means you know too much. All right, now listen, Blackie. Face can... front. I was afraid Eric Blinker might talk, but I didn't dump him in the river soon enough. And listen. I'm listening. You think I won't get Tony? Well, you're wrong. I saw you take him into that crummy rooming house. I saw what you did to him, too. He won't be moving out of there for a while. That means I have plenty of time. Hey, Blackie, So, listen. mister, I hate to do a killing without getting paid for it. But as long as you know so much, well, I'm afraid you don't give me much choice, do you? Are you talking for your own amusement? I'm giving you a chance to say your prayers, if you still know how. Hey, Blackie, look, Face we can... front. Well, what difference does it make? What? Huh? If I should see you, I mean. If you're going to kill me... Let's just say I prefer it this way. Are you ready? <laughs> Are you kidding? You think you're going to get away with this? I'm absolutely sure of it. And I asked you... Do you Mr. think I'd come here looking for you without taking I precautions? I think you've said enough. Now, do you feel this gun in the back of your head? I could tell by his voice well, that he stood directly thing. behind me. I It'll put my right heel face. tightly against the leg of the piano Not bench. The and sun. then as I felt the cold muzzle of his Ready, gun Mr. against the back of my head, I suddenly right dropped now? to the floor, kicking the bench against his... Like... <laughs> well, Blackie, I'm afraid your rather unique career has finally come to an end. This... Listen, if you... Down, boy. Down. Nailing Blackie for the murder of Eric the Stooley made it easy for me to keep Mr. Milford out of the picture completely. Nor did Blackie talk. Some cold in the underworld, I guess. As for the expense account? Well, in view of the fee that was handed to me, you can forget it. Tony Farringer, incidentally, never did quite know what happened to him. Now, will somebody please give me a nice, clean case to work on? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Marvin Miller, Lawrence Dobkin, and Russell Thorson. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.